are ready to worship with them.
Y'all feeling awake now? Come on, say freedom! No, okay, let's do it like this. Freedom! That's it, that's what I'm talking about. Isn't that good? Man, Spirit of the Lord is there. There's freedom, there's freedom for you today in this room. Hey, let's make some noise for our online campus right now. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Wish you were here. Right now, though, turn to someone next to you, welcome them, and then we're going to have some more fun. Hey, what's up, Foothills family? You guys have a seat with me real quick. I got a couple things I want to share with you this morning. As you all came in, you got your Foothills flyer. I would love for you to take a moment and check that out. There's some Foothills facts in there with some important dates and information. Also, there's a connection card in there. If you all would, when you have a chance, take a moment, fill out that connection card for us, and as you leave the auditorium this morning following our service, drop it in the bucket. But if you're a first time guest with us today, first of all, let me say, welcome to Foothills. We're so honored that you guys are here. But if you would, take that uh, connection card with you, bring it to the guest room. That's the room that I'm standing in right now. Bring it in this room, following our service, Pastor Greg and some other staff will be in here. We'd love to meet you, tell you how such an honor it is that you guys are here with us. And as you can see behind me, there's some bags on the shelf. That's a free gift for you that we want you guys to have as you leave this morning. Just to say thank you for hanging out with us today. Now, a couple of announcements for you as we get going. March the 3rd, it is our next Get in the Game, and we're so excited about this. We would be honored to have you guys come and join us in that. And what that is... It's a conversation with Pastor Greg and some other staff to let you know how you can get connected here at Foothills. We don't want you just to come and sit and enjoy the service. We want you guys to get connected and let God use you to help us take what God is doing here to a next level. So if you're interested in that and that's for you, we've got free food for you, free child care as well. Get registered for that online or you can go to our Connection Center found in the concourse and we would love to see you at our next Get in the Game on March the 3rd. Now, some up and coming things that are happening. We've got the weekend, this weekend, February 22nd through the 24th. That is all, for all students, 7th to 12th grade. I would love for you guys to get registered for that. Today is the deadline to register because I've got to make sure I got everything taken care of. Small group leaders, host homes, all the event stuff. Man, I want to make sure that I got you and your student taken care of. So I need you guys to get registered for that today. $40 for a weekend that they will never forget. This will be a life-changing weekend, and I do not want your student to miss that. Also, we have our kids camp coming up, and that's called Transform. And that's from June the 18th through the 21st. There is limited spots for this. So you want to make sure that you guys get that taken care of today because also the deposit is due today. For more information, you can go online or you can also go over to the kids' check-in area and they'll have some uh, people there to answer some questions that you guys might have. This next announcement that I got for you guys, I am so excited because of all the life change that has taken place within our church. We've got baptism coming up on March the 17th. Mark your calendar down as we're going to celebrate that day, all the life change that has taken place. And if you are ready to take your next step in your walk with Christ in baptism, I would encourage you and challenge you to get signed up and registered for that today. You can go online, connection card, or at our connection center in the concourse and make that happen. It will be a life changing day on that day, March 17th, and you don't want to miss it. Now, for more information of everything that we've got going on, we've got so much going on. I would love for you guys to go check out our website at foothills.cc. Check out all the information there. You can also go on our social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Foothill CC, and find out all the up and coming things and also to stay connected within our church. Today, today's a great day. We start a brand new series on Daniel and Pastor Greg is back with us this morning and I'm telling you, he is ready to bring the word. But for us to get ready to hear the word, we've got to have our hearts prepared. So if you guys would stand with me, we got so much to praise the Father for and let's praise him this morning. Come on church, let's go. It's going to be a great day. Come on, y'all ready? Y'all feeling it? Somebody say, somebody say, I got to praise. See, that's our, that's our response this morning is to praise our great and mighty God. Say, I got to praise. 31 people gave their lives to the Lord last week. Somebody say, I got to praise. Can somebody say, I got to praise.
All glory and power and praise to our God forever and ever and ever. Amen. We're going to move into our time of giving. I'm going to ask our campus hosts, y'all can come on forward. If you're with us online, so glad you're here today. Uh, there's a, you can give, there's a little tab right above you that says giving, and you can give that way. As the buckets are being passed, y'all can give in the room, or you can go online. But today, you're giving to a vision that is reaching people. I said it a few minutes ago, but 31 people last week turned from death to life. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I don't know if that you can comprehend this. I want to say it again because the response wasn't what I want. 31 people got saved last week. Come on! Yeah! Guys, guys, God is moving in this place, in our church. We're seeing it every week. God is doing incredible things. And when you give at Foothills, that's what you're giving to. You're giving to life change. That's why we give. We give to that. So as we give today, let's just remember why. We give because God has given to us, and we have salvation. And that has been springing up from the ground around here. So let's pray. Jesus, we are thankful, God. God, we are thankful for the freedom that we have to come in this, this, this church every week. God, we're thankful for the hope that we have in the Son of God. And Lord, as we give today, Lord, we pray that you use the tithes, this offering to reach more and more people. God, we're not going to stop reaching people. So God, we pray that you bless this offering and that you use it to further the ministry here. God, you are good. Lord, I pray this morning that from the depths of our soul, we sing and we raise a hallelujah to our great mighty God today. We love you, Jesus. It's your name I pray. Amen. Come on, we're going to sing this together. I raise a hallelujah. the presence of my enemy. Come on. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Yeah. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody.
mess. Some of us are in a mess, but because the strength that you give us and the hope that you give us and the voice that you put in us, we can tell the devil no, and we can raise our hallelujah. Be with Greg as he comes back and brings the word. Amen. ever travel to a foreign country, what you notice immediately is that you're in a totally different culture. The people sometimes look different, they act different, they speak differently, they think differently, they look at the world a little differently than we do based on the culture we came from. And you don't even actually have to go to another country to experience that. You can go to different regions of the United States and there's a different culture, right? If you're from the South and you go to the North, it's a totally different culture. If you go out west, it's a different culture. You don't even have to go across the United States. You can go from city to city and you'll experience different cultures or different homes. From one family to the next, there are different cultures. Culture is a really interesting thing. My wife and I just got back from a couple of weeks in Mexico and we experienced a different culture. We love Mexico. The the Mexican culture is different than the United States of America, as you can imagine. If you've been there, you know what I'm saying. But what we like about it, in our minds, is that some of the culture is really family-oriented. It reminds me of the United States 30 or 40 years ago, that there's a big emphasis on the family unit. We went one evening, it was a Sunday evening, we went to a local park, and most of the people, everybody there but us were just local people, and, and it was like a playground. It wasn't anything special, just a Sunday night, and everybody, just like a couple hundred people are in the park, kids playing, screaming, having fun, parents all over the place, not one person had their cell phone out except us with, you know, we're videoing all of it, but none of them have their cell phones out because they're engaged in the family culture. That's what they're doing. The Mexican culture is very family oriented, but it's also a friendly uh, uh, culture of respect and honor, and it's just their kindness about them, and it's just a little different. And and up until this year, because we've gone a lot of times to Mexico, up until this year, I've really never tried to engage in the culture especially when it came to the language. I would just go there, and I would, I would be the tourist on vacation. I would go, and I would leave, and I would just not you know, really engage whatsoever. But uh, a couple of years ago, we, we realized that sometimes you need to engage a little better, especially when you go to a place that speaks a different language. And so we went uh, a couple of years ago, and we wanted to get some suntan lotion. And we went to this little Mexican version of a dollar store. And unfortunately, nobody in there spoke English except us. And every clerk, all they, they, not even broken English, it was just Spanish. And we don't, we didn't speak any Spanish. And so it was, we were trying to figure out how to communicate. We wanted suntan lotion because we'd walk through all the aisles. We couldn't find it. And finally, we decided what we'd do is we'd play a little game of charades because that had to work, right? And so my wife and I are doing our, this, and, and I, if I was a fly on the wall, it would probably look ridiculous, but we're trying to explain to this, this Mexican clerk what, that we wanted uh, suntan lotion, and so we start with the sun in the sky. We're going like this, and we don't know that what we call the sun. We're like, sunolo, sun, sunny. Well, you know, we don't know what to call it, the sun, the sea in the eye. And we're like, we're laying here, and we're going lotion, and they're, they're looking, the lady's looking at us like, loco gringos, right? They don't know what they're talking about. So we're trying harder and harder. Finally, she goes, ah, like this, like, I got it. We're like, perfect. So she takes us down the aisles, and we end up there, and she takes us here, and she's like, here you are, and we look, it's like garbage bags or something, like, no, 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 no. What we have here is a failure to communicate, right? We just don't, we're not on the same page. So this time, I thought it was going to be different. I'm going to go, and I'm going to engage in the culture a little bit. I'm going to learn the language, and so uh, I, I knowing we were going for the last few months, I went online, Duolingo, free app, you can learn different languages, and I started to learn some basic Spanish, and uh, never taken Spanish, and I was learning 
And uh, I'm not fluent by any stretch of imagination, but I can find the bathroom, okay? <laughs> Donde es el baño? So I know that because you don't want to try to do charades with that one. You follow me? <laughs> so I figured I needed that one. So, so we learned some basic Spanish, and I engaged in the culture, and it, was, it made the trip actually a little better because I could communicate on basic things. Now, sometimes it's good to engage in a culture like that when you're going on vacation just to kind of get a better feel of what, they, what they're going through and what they do and how they uh, communicate. Uh, bless you. But uh, sometimes it's, uh, it, you know, when you do that, it's, it's a good thing. But other times you go into a, a different culture, and it's not good to engage that culture. We're going to be starting a new series in the book of Daniel today. And we're going to look at Daniel 1. And Daniel 1 is really a, a, a chapter about an indoctrination into a culture that was different than what Daniel and his friends had experienced back in Israel. Let me give you the context, and we're going to jump in. We've got a lot to cover because we're going to try to cover an entire chapter. Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel is, is really focused a lot about this whole idea of, of you know, the name of the series is I Won't Back Down because it's really a, a series about that. Daniel and his friends, they just, they just don't back down. They don't... They don't allow culture to uh, indoctrinate them into what they believe. So Daniel and his, and his buddies, they're teenagers in the beginning of the story of Daniel. And they're from Israel. And Israel, because God has, has taken his hand of protection off of the nation of Israel because they've turned their backs on God. And God removes his hand of protection. And he allows the Babylonians to go and conquer the Israelites. And then they take some of them back captive, including Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He brings these teenagers back because, and, and, he, and he puts them in a position where they're going to start this indoctrination uh, procedure to get them to become good Babylonian young men because they were bright and they were intelligent and they came from royal families. And they figured by doing this that they could get these guys who had a lot of promise and make them Babylonians. And so they started this indoctrination. And what you're going to see is that Daniel and his friends decide, we're not going to play that game. We, we're not going down that road. We'll allow it to a certain point, but we're not going to allow the culture to change what we believe. Now, here's where I think the parallel is for us today and why this series, I think, is timely. Because I think if you look and if you were just being honest with yourself, for those of us who have been around uh, for, for a few decades, we've already seen this, this, how the culture of the United States have, has changed, hasn't it? We've, we were once this proud nation, one nation under God. And we see now that there's a snowball effect that, uh, of moving away from God that seems to be at a rapid pace like none other before. Now we don't want to, not only do we not want to call ourselves a nation under, one nation under God, but we want to remove all context of God with, throughout our culture. And so there, there, is a, there are literally groups of people who are strategically doing that right in our midst, right in our presence, and it feels a lot of times like we're helpless to do anything about it. Now you, it seems like you can't say Merry Christmas, you can't have a nativity scene in front of a government building, they don't want to swear on a Bible, you don't want to mention God. We want to remove God from the entire uh, context of the United States of America, which, which is founded on biblical principles. And if you're a parent, let me tell you something, you're a parent or a grandparent, it's scary, isn't it? You're raising your kids, you're raising your grandkids, whatever, and you're going, man, what is it going to look like if we fast forward just a few more decades, a couple of generations further? How, much, how far can this go before God removes his hand of protection from us? And as I look around and I see young people of promise, I think this book is particularly important to you guys and gals. Because you're the hope of the future of not only the United States, but of the world and of, of, uh, of the body of Christ of leading out in the days ahead. So there's some responses, unfortunately, that many of us have, the wrong responses. It's kind of a knee-jerk reaction to the culture that we live in. One of the responses that some people have, and this is the wrong one, is that we just engage totally in the culture. We just go, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans, and so I just kind of become part of the problem. I don't become part of the solution. I'm part of the problem. I just go with the flow, and I do what everybody else is doing, and I make no difference whatsoever. I just, you couldn't tell a believer from an unbeliever because of the way that we live. And I think as followers of Jesus, that's not an option. Would you agree with that? We, that's not an option. But the second option is really not much better, and I see a lot of Christians do this one, and it's where we basically circle the wagons, and we get in our little holy huddles, 
and we don't want the world to contaminate us, and we don't want to engage the culture whatsoever, and we don't want to be people who change the culture, and so we just get in our little protective Christian cocoons, and everything we do has, is, is some, has some Christian Christianese around. It's like, I, I got I to, gotta, you know, go to this place because it's a Christian place. I got to eat Christian food. I got to listen to Christian music. I, gotta, I, don't wanna, I don't want any of the world touching me, and that's not the biblical response either, by the way. The third response, though, is the response of Daniel and his friends, and I think that's the response all of us need, and that's the title of this message, How to Live Right Side Up in an Upside Down World. How do we do that? How do we live in a culture that's changing so rapidly away from the things of God, and how can we become difference makers and history makers? What do we need to do, and how do we respond to the culture? Do we just give up? Do we just circle the wagons? Do we just wave the white flag of surrender? Do we go with it, or do we stand up for something? And that's what Daniel and his friends do. And Daniel actually had a strategy. I don't know if he actually thought it out, but it was a strategy that he used against the indoctrination that he was up against. So I want to pick this up in Daniel chapter 1, and I, want to, I just got three points for you. But we're going to literally cover the entire chapter today, so let's get moving. Now I'm going to give you Daniel's strategy for living right side up in an upside down world. The first thing you need to do, and every single one of us needs to do this, is we need to know what we believe, who we are, and more importantly, whose we are. We need to know what we believe, we need to know who we are, and whose we are. If we're going to live right side up in an upside down world, I've got to really get this down pat. I've got to know what I believe. I've got to have a strong conviction of my beliefs. I've got to know who I am at my core and who God calls me. And then I've got to know whose I am because I'm God's property. And so as we look at this, what we're going to see is that not only did Daniel have a, a strategy against the indoctrination of the culture, but the Babylonians had a strategy to try to bring them into their culture. And I want to show you this. That the first thing you notice is in Daniel chapter 1, verse three, verses 3 through 5, they try to work first in the way that they think, in their minds. This is where indoctrination always comes out. This is where culture changes, by the way. If you look at culture shifts in the United States of America, what you will see is that people who are working against the things of God strategically move to change the way that we think. Because if we can change the way that we think, we can change the way that we act. Because as a man thinks in his heart, the Bible says, so is he. So this is why you see this, this, uh, this kind of this movement toward moving into the school systems because young minds are very impressionable. And if we can indoctrinate young, then we can, when they will grow up believing a certain thing. This is why Daniel and his friends were teenagers and targeted by the Babylonians because there was still a possibility they could change the way they think. For us that have, you know, that we're a little older, it's hard to change our way of thinking. We get a little more, you know, we, we're not very flexible any longer. But young people are, and this is why they did this. So, so here's what they did. They started with their mind. Here's what it says. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who'd been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. And so what they do, the, the Babylonians, now that they have taken them captive, the king says, I want the, the best and the brightest and the strongest and the smartest guys, and you bring them to me, and, and we're going to just kind of bring them into our culture, and we're going to put them through this three years of training, literally a three-year course in Babylonian leadership, and we're going to make these guys our future leaders because after they've been here long enough, they'll forget everything back in Israel. They'll forget what's going on back there. So they wanted to change. It says that they, the, the, they targeted um, the training in literature and language. And so that what they wanted to do was to get them to think differently. Now, how did they think in Babylon versus back in Israel? In Israel, there was a focus, even though the majority of the Israelites had, had turned away from God, and that's why God had 
lifted his hand of protection, and they were now subject to the Babylonians. There were still a few people who were faithful in their following of, of God, and, and among them were Daniel and his friends. And so for them, they were coming from the one true living God in Israel. They were brought to Babylon where there were multiple gods. There was a focus on superstition and black magic and witchcraft and the occult and all these things. And they wanted to change the way that they thought. And this is what we see in our own country. So we have to be careful. We protect our minds. That's what we know. The second thing that they worked on, this is still under point one, is that they wanted to change uh, what they believed, but also... They wanted to change who they were, their identity. So it goes on and say in verse 6, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Now he wants to rename them. It wants a new identity. Daniel was called Belshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission, not these these unacceptable foods. So let me explain what's going on here. So once they decide to change the way that they think through through training them in literature and language and all these things, they wanted the the whole idea of the focus changing. They wanted to then change who they were. So they think, let's go ahead and change their names. Let's give them Babylonian names. They'll forget who they were. And so they start renaming them. And you go, what's the big deal? Well, in that culture, it was a super big deal because names implied your future, and they really had meaning. We don't really do that as much these days. We name our children based on maybe what's popular or in some name book. I actually had a conversation with a friend this week who lives in another state. They're about to give birth to to another child, a a boy, and he told me the child's name. I said, that's a new name. What's the the meaning behind that? And it it was a different name. He said, that's the Greek word for give God glory. And it comes from Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And our prayer is that our young men will grow up to be a man of righteousness who will bring God glory for everything he does. I said, man, I feel so bad the way I name my kids now. I mean, you had to show me up like that? Because, like, I didn't have that kind of thought behind it. But that's, that's how it was back then. So when you were given a name, there was implications of something about that that, that was important. So names were valuable, and so they immediately say, let's change the way they think. Let's change their identity. Let's give them a new name. Let's give them Babylonian names so they can forget where they came from and who they are. And so I want to, just to give you an idea, Daniel, uh, his his name, Daniel, they changed to Belteshazzar. We continue to call him Daniel, but Daniel, literally, his Jewish name, listen what it means. It means the Lord is my judge. That was what his name meant. The Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, here's what it means. And this is what they wanted to change it. Belteshazzar means Bells, B-E-L-S. That's the title for the king. Is, uh, so it, it's, it's called the king's prince. In other words, he, he is now his allegiance moved away from the Lord as his judge to the king of Babylon. And they wanted his identity different. And then finally, they worked on who's, they wanted to change even more than that, and, and you, you might heard the reference about the food. Because one of the things that the king ordered is that Daniel and his friends now would start eating this food from the king's table. It was good food. I mean, it was the best food you could get. It was, it was the best of the best. The richest food, the, you know, the finest wines, all those things. And he's like, you're going to eat there because I want, I want to fatten you up. I want to make you strong. So Daniel and his friends objected to that. And they said, look... Um, we don't want to do that. So they, they went to the chief of staff and said, can, can we make an exception for us? We don't want to do that. We just want vegetables and water. Right? I'm like, huh? okay. We want vegetables and water. And the, and the chief of staff said, I can't do that because you're going to get skinny. The king's going to get mad that you're skinny. He's going to kill me. And they said, tre- chest, test us for 10 days. If we're not stronger than those guys, then we'll change. 10 days later, they look better than everybody. So there's, a, there's one more area now that they're trying to really bring them into, and that's whose they were. And it's through the area of food, which sounds weird, but I'll explain it. Now, here's the last part of the, the scripture. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So you go, okay, what's the big deal now about the food? Why is this important, and well, how's that change whose they are? Well... The food, the reason that Daniel and his friends objected to the food brought by the king 
was that that food had been sacrificed to idols. It was not kosher. It didn't follow any of the Jewish dietary laws that they, were, they had grown up with. And by eating that, they would literally defile themselves before God. And their conscience and conviction said, we're not going to do this. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm picturing uh, teenagers, right? I think about this. Teenagers, a thousand miles away from home for the first time in their lives. They're now in captivity to Babylonians. They're being ordered to eat this food. And yet they, they stand up for what they believe in and said, we're not going to do it. We're not, we'd, rather eat, we'd rather eat vegetables and water than to defile ourselves by eating the king's food. See, the reason that Daniel didn't object to the teaching and training that they tried to do by, by uh, indoctrinating their minds is because they knew what they believed. The reason they didn't object to the name change of having a Babylonian name because they knew who they were. But the reason they objected to the food that they were getting because they didn't want to defile themselves and their relationship with God. And their conviction was strong. Now, here's the problem that I see. And young people, listen to me. A thousand miles away from home, first time. Nobody would know. Who would know? It wasn't like they were actually doing anything real bad. They were just going to eat the king's food. But in their minds, they knew that there was a line drawn there that they had to be drawn and they weren't allowing themselves to do it. I look around, and unfortunately, we have our students who've been raised in Christian homes for 18 years, who go off to college 100 miles away from home, and have, have forsaken everything they've known to participate in what's going on in Babylon. Why is that? Why don't we have the kind of conviction that these people had? Young people, why don't we just go with this kind of conviction that says, I am not. I might be in Babylon, and by the way, listen, the Bible is clear. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is not our home. Our home is in heaven. And so we're literally living in a Babylon of, of, of a, a, a culture that's moving away from the things of God. And what we need is to, uh, people of, to be people of conviction and, and stand up for what's right. And that leads me to the second point. And that is this, the, which, uh, the second thing we need to do, and this is Daniel's strategy for living right side up, is that when you feel overwhelmed, remember who's in control. And I'm going to tell you something. It is so easy to feel like it's out of control. You look on social media, you listen to watch TV, and it looks like our world is totally going so, you know, south so fast, like going to hell in a handbasket. And we feel hopeless to do anything, and we're raising our kids, and we're raising our grandkids, and we're, and we're looking around, or you, maybe you're a young person, you're going, what am I going to do? I mean, how do I even stand up for this? And what you have to remember is that God is ultimately in control. He is sovereign. He's in charge of everything. There's nothing that takes God by surprise. In fact, the very thing that you're going to see is that God had prearranged and ordained everything that was going on in this story. And let me show you three different places where this happens just in the first chapter. In verses 1 and 2, which I did not read earlier, during the third year uh, of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, this is in Israel, in Judah, in southern Israel, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord, watch this. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects of the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in a treasure house of his God. Now this is really interesting because the king Jehoiakim was the king of Judah, which would have been God's people. And the Bible is clear that God gave them to the Babylonian king that were opposed to God. He literally, it was God ordains and God said, all right, you're going to turn your back on me? Go for it. And God allowed them to be taken captive because God had a bigger plan. So in the midst of the chaos, God was still in control. In Daniel 1.9, it says, now, this is speaking of Daniel and his friends. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. The reason that the chief of staff said, okay, I'm going to give you, allow you to have that test in the food for 10 days is because God had put this uh, respect and affection in his heart for Daniel. In verse 17, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. It was all God. 
And I'm going to tell you something, guys. When we look and we get scared and we start living in fear and we see the world, you know, going in a wrong direction, let's not forget that God's ultimately in control. But it's hard. And it's scary. Because things are changing so quick. I mean, I've seen it within my lifetime. And I know many of you have as well. At what point does God say, all right, enough is enough? Remember the story in, of Joseph in the Old Testament? You know, Joseph's story was similar, right? Joseph kept having bad things happen to him, but it was ultimately that God had a plan that it, he would end up in prison and eventually become the second in command of all of Egypt. And by being in that position, he literally was able to save the entire nation of Israel from the famine. But God had ordained it. Guys, let's not live in fear. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. Yes, it's, it, these are difficult times, but we can do something about it. And that's the last point. And Daniel's strategy, here what it, was, what it is, bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. As I said, the world that we live in here, this earth, is not our home. We're citizens of heaven. We're on a temporary assignment here. There's a purpose here while we're here. We're here to bring glory to God. But we're also here to influence this, the culture that we live in. Here's, here's a couple of verses, all right? This is Hebrews chapter 13. For this world is not our permanent home. We're looking forward to a home yet to come. That's, that's our hope as, as followers of Jesus. But in the meantime, we're here. In the meantime, we've got a life to live. Do we just give up? Do we just go with it? Or do we just circle the wagons? Or do we do something about it? I believe that God wants us to do something about it. I, I believe that God wants us to be thermostats, not thermometers. That he wants us to stand out, not blend in. That he wants us to transform the culture, not to conform to the culture. I believe that God's got us here for a reason. And there is hope if we all determine in our minds that we're not going to just become victims of our culture. We're going to change our culture for the glory of God. That's what we're going to do. And I think that's what Daniel was all about. He's like, all right, I'm in a bad situation. I don't have a lot of say-so in the matter. I've been taken as a prisoner, and I've been indoctrinated or attempted to be indoctrinated in this culture. But I'm not going to just idly just you know, stand by. I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. I'm going to do something about this, and I'm going to change the world around me. And in Daniel chapter 1, it says this. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. They'd passed the test. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters of his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. So what did Daniel do? Daniel didn't pout. Daniel didn't complain. Daniel didn't freak out. He didn't panic. He just said, I'm here, and I'm going to be the best that I could possibly be. And that's what he was, ten times better than anybody around him. He, he decided, you know what, if God's put me here, and God is in control, then there's a reason for it, and I need to be out there on the front lines trying to change things for the glory of God. And this is exactly what he does. God has it for us too, right? We, we need to be out in our culture, and we need to engage our culture for the things of God. We need to challenge things that are opposing the things of God. We need to not just give up. Because culture, here's the thing about culture. As I said, culture is an interesting thing. But culture can change. We've just said it. Our, our culture has changed over the last, I don't know, how many years? You know, every year it changes. Every decade it changes. And culture can change. But here's the key to culture change. There's got to be a commitment for the long term. And, it's, and, it, and this is how cultures change. I want you to think down the road, 10 miles down the road, uh, at, down at Clemson. Do you remember it wasn't that long ago that, that the, the, the term Clemsoning was around? And what that was was that was, that was a, that was a uh, word that was given because Clemson, at some point in, in history, they got, to the, they got to the point where they were losing about every game they should have won. Even when they would get it ahead, they would Clemson, right? And that, that they would fall apart and they would lose. That was the culture. And it hadn't won a national championship since 1981. And they had just reserved themselves that we're just going to try to, we'll play not to lose, but we end up losing anyways. Well, Dabo Sweeney came in and he said, we're going to change the culture. 
We're going to change our mindset. We're going to change what we believe and, and, and who we are. We're, going to, we're, going to be around. we're just going to change the culture. And with enough time, he was able to do that. Now, the Clemsoning, that word is no longer used because now we're winning national championships and everybody's looking at Clemson and go, what are they doing over there? What is going on? And this is why all the recruits want to come and play because of the culture. You listen to what they say. It's a family atmosphere. It's fun. They're having a good time. They're dancing in the locker rooms. The culture has changed. We can change the culture, but we got to be committed for the long term. That's how it changes. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes people who are committed. It takes people who are saying, you know what, I'm going to be like a Daniel, like a Shadrach, like a Meshach and Abednego, who's going to say, all right, I might be in the world, but I'll not be of the world. I'm going to be a game changer. I'm going to be the kind of person who, when I go to my school, or I go to my place of work, or I go where I hang out, I'm going to be the one who makes, I'm not going to just go with the flow. I'm going to be an influencer. I'm going to be a leader. And I'm going to refuse to just kind of give up and give in. I'm going to stand up for what's right. And I, I tell you something. There, we, got, we, got, we got a problem in, in most of Christianity. We don't have enough backbone. We bow down way too easy. And we don't stand up and fight. And I think there's a time that we say, you know what? Enough is enough. We're, we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to live out our convictions. And we're going to change our world for Christ as best we can until he comes back. That's what we have to do. Otherwise, we're going to look back and we're going to, we're going to see our kids. We're going to see our grandkids. And we're going to look back and we go, we could have done something. But we stood by and watched it happen right on our watch. It's not going to happen. We're going to do what we need to do. And so we have a, we have a system put in place. Where we, we, we're able to vote our conviction. We're able to, we live in a country that still has those freedoms. We can do things. We can stand up. We can make a difference in our community. And I'm not talking about being obnoxious. That doesn't help anything. We're trying to lead people to Christ. What I've discovered a long time ago is that it's a whole lot. When some, if we can just, 31 people gave their life to Jesus last week. Let me tell you what happens when people give their life to Jesus. The way they think changes the way they view things different uh, changes. The way they act, the way they vote, the way they, the way they participate in the, in the culture changes. The best change agent is Jesus working through the Holy Spirit in people's lives. That's what we're called to do is change our life to bloom where we're planted. What Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 5. He said, you are the light of the world. That's what we're called to be. We're the light of the world. We're in a dark world. We're in a culture that's dark. And Jesus said, you're the light. You're, you are it. You're, this is, you're there not to just be more darkness, but to be light, to change things. If you have a dark room and you put a light in there, it changes the room, doesn't it? That's what we're called to do. We got enough of us that are lights. We can change darkness. That's what we do. That's what it's about. That's what Daniel did. And that's why I'm pumped about this book, because that was a lot to take in in one message. But it sets the groundwork for the next three weeks. As we look at over and over again that these guys are put into pressure cookers and they're put in these positions where, they're, where they have to either just man up or die. That's, I mean, it, it's, this, there was no playing games back then. This was life and death, and, and I'm thankful for people of conviction. So I wanna, here's what I want to do. Um, first of all, I, I want to pray for our young people. And I know we have a ton of kids over in our children's area, but we've got teenagers in here. We've got college students in here. And I want to pray for the younger generation, and I want to pray for the parents who've got children who are, you know, probably living in that fear, of what's going to happen to my kids, or grandparents. I just, let's just have a time of prayer, and then let's say, God, use me. Use me. Make me the brightest light possible. Let me be a Daniel in a world full of, you know, people who are just, you know, not willing to stand up. Let's pray. God, you are so amazing. Lord, I, I, I know that there are some young people in this room that, are, that are, can change the world for the glory of God, but there's a tension in this world that's pulling, that tide is just pulling them away, and they've got to be stronger. And I pray through the Holy Spirit that they would just yield to the Holy Spirit's power and presence in their lives, that they would, be, they would, they would truly be thermostats, and that they would change the culture. God, I believe that I know we've got teenagers and young people here that are leaders. 
that they have the potential to, to, to literally do anything that you've called them to do if they will just yield to what you're calling them to do. I pray for the parents in the room who have small children who are living with that fear and that sense of helplessness and what are we going to do and how is this going to work out and what's going to happen to my kids. And Lord, I just pray that as parents we would equip our children to be able to, to, to navigate the waters in a healthy way to live right side up in an upside down world. Lord, for maybe those of us who we're in a grandparent stage or we maybe don't have kids or whatever, but we need to stand up as well and we need to say, you know what? I'm not going to just stand idly by. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to change their hearts and the way that they view the world. God, we pray for the leadership we have in our, in our country, in our, in our state, in our cities, that you would give them wisdom to know how to govern and, and, and to lead and to do the things that they need to do. Because we look around, we realize that there's a, there's a lot of things that are going in, in the wrong direction. But I pray that there would be a revival in our country, that we would once again be in one nation under God people would rise up and say, you know what, I've tried everything else, it doesn't work, we're turning back to the one true living God. Because that's our heritage, that's, that's how we were founded as a country. Lord, I just pray that you would not remove your protective hand from us, that you continue moving in our midst. I pray, Lord, for those who don't know Jesus in this room, and those who watch online, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. 31 people last week giving their lives to Jesus. What an amazing thing, God. Thank you. But there are people here, there are people online today that need Jesus more than anything. This is not a lesson in morality. This is a lesson of, of saying, hey, I want to yield to Jesus Christ as King of all. And if that is you, and you need your sins forgiven, and you want your salvation, but you are willing to commit your life for Jesus, maybe offer a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Take it all, every part of me. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I believe that you died on a cross for my sin and you rose again so that I can have life. God, continue the revival you've started in this place. Send us out as lights in a dark world. As hope in a, in a world full of hopelessness. Of people with confidence knowing that we have a God who's in control of all things, even when it looks out of control. Thank you, Lord, that you have never left us nor forsaken us name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, if you've given your life to Jesus, first of all, I am pumped about that. Let us know in your connection card. Just check off the box. I've committed my life to Christ. We'll help you any way we can. Go ahead and read the second chapter. That's your homework assignment. Read the second chapter of Daniel. We'll cover that. More exciting thing about these young guys and, and, and what's going on in their lives. This is going to be a great series. Um, I won't back down. That's the name of the series, and we're not going to back down. Let's be, uh, let's be game changers out there, guys. I love you. Uh, oh, a guest room, hanging out in a guest room. I'd love to meet you there if you're a guest. Uh, you heard all of the great things coming up. Don't forget to sign up for getting a game. We'd love to have you there, too. And baptism coming up soon. Love you guys. Have a great week. See you next week. Nothing's bare, nothing hiding. Every thought, every deed, every failure been in those to be. You behold them and you love.